Christ went the building to Take a look at the beginning this morning for the book of Psalms, Psalms 32, verses 7 and 8. Psalms 32, verses 7 and 8. The psalmist says, Concerning God, thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Look at the last part of this this morning. For the Lord says, I will guide thee with mine eye. The Lord's people need guiding. And they need guiding by God. He said, I will guide thee with mine eye. The eye of God is mentioned several times in the scriptures in, in various ways as being a blessing to the Lord's children. In the book of 1 Peter 3.12, the Apostle Peter says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their cry. The Lord sees all and knows all. This is similar to what we find the Lord saying to Moses when He called him to go back to Egypt to bring Israel out of Egyptian bondage. In Exodus chapter 3, He says, I have seen their affliction. I have heard their groanings. And therefore, I will deliver them. I'm thankful to pray to a God and to preach about a God who is omnipresent and omniscient, as well as being omnipotent. That means He has all power in heaven and earth. He has all understanding, and He sees and knows all things. Therefore, the Lord can guide us 
with his eye. He sees around every curve. He sees over every mountain. He sees through every valley. There's no place that the Lord eye cannot see. And I, I got thinking about this a little bit when I was doing some general Bible reading this week. It was in the ninth chapter in the book of Numbers. And I, I want to go there in just a moment, but I want to go back to this thought that the Lord said, I will guide thee with mine eye, in contrast to man in his nature. In Jeremiah 10, 23, Jeremiah says, O Lord, I know there's not within man to direct his steps. Man by nature doesn't know how to walk in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. He really is walking in darkness. He lives in a dark world, and by nature he is darkness, as Paul writes to the Ephesians. He says, you were sometimes darkness, but now you're light in the Lord, walking therefore in the light of the Lord. So man by nature, Jeremiah again says, I know it's not in man to direct his steps. Man doesn't have the wisdom to direct his steps. He doesn't have the knowledge and the understanding to direct his steps in a way that would please God. He just kind of follows the course of nature like water does when it comes down a hill. It's going to take the path of least resistance, right? It just, where the, it is, that's the way it's going to go. And that's the way man is. But I was looking over there in the ninth chapter in the book of Numbers and also the beginning of chapter 10. And I find a very unusual way that God led Israel once he brought them out of the land of Egypt. We led them by a pillar of a cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. That's always kind of captivated my imagination, what that must have looked like. We have no picture of that. We just have a description of it, that God sent a cloud. This was supernatural. This was miraculous. Clouds are something that we have been held with our eyes all the days of our lives, and you may have looked up at the sky and saw a cloud in a certain formation, and it reminded you of some image you know, of a person or an animal or whatever. And just a few seconds later, it, it changes and you lose that, but maybe another image is formed. But those just happen according to the course of nature. This was a supernatural cloud that God sent. It says it was a pillar of a cloud in the daytime, a pillar of fire at night. This first appears to us in the 13th chapter of Exodus. We find where God has brought the tenth and final plague, the death of the firstborn. Pharaoh now has relented and told Israel to leave and to go. And so the Lord does everything he had prophesied he was going to do. When they leave, they do not leave empty-handed. They borrowed of the Egyptians with never intentions of paying them back. They borrowed of the Egyptians gold and silver and, and all these kind of things because they had nothing. They'd never been paid anything. So they're just getting what they deserve. They're just getting paid late, I suppose. But anyway, the Lord had prophesied about this. And we find where Moses took the bones of Joseph and brought them out of there like Joseph had required over 200 some years before that. And then the Bible says that the Lord gave them a pillar of a cloud in the daytime, a pillar of fire at night, and it never departed from them to lead them. That's an unusual way to be led, isn't it? But God led them in this manner, in this way, because they were going to have to travel in the wilderness for a while before they could get to the land of Canaan. God brought them out of Egypt with the express purpose of bringing them into the land of Canaan, the promised land. And there was two routes they could go, as you read there in Exodus chapter 13. The shorter route would have to go through the land of the Philistines. The Lord didn't choose the short route. He knew they'd be faced with a real possibility of war, conflict, if they did that. And they would just not be up to that. So he led them around the long way. And he led them on this pillar of a cloud again in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. Now, God here is leading an entire nation. And we'll get back to this in just a moment, but the Lord will lead his children individually as well. I read about the experience of Jacob and always marvel at the language that's used in his experience. You find this in the book of Genesis chapter 28 and also in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy. And you need to kind of put these two together because on this occasion we find where Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau. Remember how he had deceived his father Isaac and taken the blessing of the firstborn he was going to give Isaac. He had deceived him. He had lied to him. Up to this point, Jacob has been nothing but a scoundrel. Jacob has lived up to his name, which means trickster and supplanter. 
And when you read in Romans chapter 9, where Paul says, For the children having not yet been born, having this, uh, having not yet been born, uh, for as it is written, the elder shall serve the younger, having done neither good nor evil, as it is written, the elder shall serve the younger. And Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. If you just stopped, started reading about Jacob, gotten to this point, you're going to think, now why would he have ever loved Jacob? <laughs> but see, those whom God loves, he has never loved any of his children because of what was good in them, because by nature there is no good in any of them. Jacob was living up to his name, but on this occasion here, the Lord is going to bless Jacob. The Lord is going to apprehend Jacob like he did Saul of Tarsus. Remember his experience as we read in Acts chapter 9 on the way to Damascus to persecute the Lord's church, on the way to Damascus to get God's children, men, women, and children, and bring them back to Jerusalem and put them into prison for doing what you're doing here this morning. The very thing that you're doing here this morning, Paul was arresting those that he found in Damascus and was bringing them back to Jerusalem and putting them into prison. But on that occasion, the Lord apprehended him. The Lord arrested him. Every child of grace, when they've been born of the Spirit of God, have been arrested by God. Now, I, I don't want to be arrested by man, but I'm thankful for this arrest that I experienced many years ago when God arrested me and when God arrested you. And God will arrest Jacob here. But we look over here in the 28th chapter of Genesis, and we find where Jacob is in a place that's described as a desert land, a waste howled in wilderness. Now, that expression literally means that it's a, a wasteful land, like it says. A waste howling wilderness, a desert land, a non-fruitful place. Um, a place uh, that was totally void, you might say, of anything good. And this is where Jacob's at. He's in a desert land in a waste howling wilderness. And God speaks to him. And the Bible says... <clears throat> Uh, as he went, you know, he took rocks and put them on his head for a pillow, but God appeared to him in a dream at that night. He says, I'm the God of thy father Isaac and, and your grandfather Abraham, basically. He says, I will keep you. I, I am with you. I will keep you. I will bring you into the land of Canaan, and I will not leave you nor forsake you until I've done that which I have spoken. Do you notice what he said there again? He says, I'm with you. Now, that, that ought to give us all a great degree of comfort to know that God has promised to be with us. I will be with you. I will keep you. I will bring you into the land that I have promised. Now, this hasn't happened yet, but God has promised it. If God promises, it's just as good as happened. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you until I've done that which I've promised unto you. I don't know how promises could be any stronger than that. And then we come to the 32nd chapter, Deuteronomy, and we find here where the Lord uh, speaks unto Jacob. He says, I, have, I will lead thee, I will keep thee. He says, and I will keep thee as the apple of the eye. Now that expression, apple of the eye, is, a, is an important expression in the Old Testament. It shows the favor and kindness of God toward his people. It shows his grace that's upon them, his, his wonderful love upon them. David said in Psalms 17 and 8, here's a prayer of David, he says, Lord, keep me as the apple of thine eye. Have you ever used that expression maybe concerning your beloved, concerning your spouse, concerning someone that caught your attention maybe in the beginning of your romance with your wife or whatever, a husband? And that expression simply means you're the apple of my eye. You, you're just everything. I mean, you... You just can't take your eyes off the bride, right? That's what David is saying. Lord, keep me as the apple of thine eye. Uh, keep me in a special manner, in a special way. So this is what God tells Jacob. He says, as an eagle stirreth over, uh, up her nest and fluttereth over her young and spreadeth her wings and beareth them, he says, so I alone did lead you. Now we're talking about God leading Jacob in this special manner as an individual here. Now notice all the things God said he would do for him. He says, I will lead you, I will keep you as the apple of mine eye. I will never leave you nor forsake you till I bring you in and keep all the things I promised unto you. He says, as the eagle that stirreth up her nest. He gives us this image, this picture of a mother eagle stirring her nest up. It's time for the little ones to leave the nest. 
But she's not just going to kick them out. She's not just going to pitch them out. She says, stir up her nest. She beareth up her wings, spreadeth her wings, and beareth them on her wings and brings them out. Now we find this is exactly what God said he did for Israel. He brought them out of the land of Egypt. He said, I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you out of that land. Just like the eagle does. Now we see how the Lord led Jacob in this special manner, in, in the special language he uses here, a waste howling wilderness, apple of thine eye, as an eagle stirreth up her nest. Uh, I love the language that's employed here by the, by the writer. So we go back there to Numbers chapter 9 and take a look at this cloud. This cloud is mentioned over here in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Paul said, I will not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning our fathers who were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were baptized unto Moses under the cloud and under the sea. Now, the Lord gave them this cloud, a pillar of a cloud in the daytime, a pillar of fire at night, to lead them, but also to protect them and to cover them. Now, we go back to the 14th chapter of Exodus. And we find when Israel had gotten to the point of the Red Sea, it looked like that they were, they were trapped. They couldn't see how they could cross the Red Sea. They could hear the horses of Pharaoh's chariots, uh, his army coming swiftly behind them. It looked like there was no way of escape. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord and the pillar of the cloud that was in front of Israel, that led Israel up to the Red Sea, all of a sudden lifted up and came behind them and made a barrier between Israel and the Egyptians. And the Bible says it was darkness to the Egyptians, but it was light to the Israelites. You know, the ninth plague in Egypt was a plague of darkness. The Bible says the darkness was so dark you could feel the darkness. I've never, I've never been in that kind of darkness. I've been in darkness where I couldn't see my finger right in front of my eyes right there. It was so dark I could not see it. But I've never actually felt darkness except the darkness of this world. I think I can tell you, I feel the darkness of this world I live in. But from a physical point of view, literal darkness, I've never felt darkness, but that darkness is so dark, and it was dark for three days, did you know there was light in the dwellings of Israel? Now, they're all of our in the, in the same geographical area, but as I've mentioned to you a couple times in recent times, the land of Goshen is where Israel was at, and that was in the northeast corner of the land of Egypt, and there was light in the land of Goshen, and there was darkness everywhere else. This pillar of a cloud that was going to guide Israel in the daytime, a pillar of fire at night, became darkness to the Egyptians, but light to the Israelites. And then the Lord gave the commandment. He says, now, when the cloud moves, you're to move, but the cloud rests, you're to rest. So it doesn't matter if it's one day, two days, a week, month, or year, you do not move unless the cloud moves first. Now, the best I can tell, it appeared that this pillar of fire and pillar of cloud in the daytime, the pillar of fire at night, you know, a pillar is, is like a, a statue, it's like a column, but it can also mean something even smaller, like a, a monument. But I think here it, it is tall, it reaches up toward heaven, okay, because God gave it. This is supernatural. This is something God gave. All right, so here's this pillar of a cloud that covers the tabernacle, and it reaches up toward heaven. I think it was more slender here, and it came down and spread out because it covered the, the, the tabernacle. And we find when God spoke to Israel, he would come down in the cloud in the doorway of the tabernacle and speak with Moses and speak with the children of Israel. Now, again, when that cloud moved, they were to move. And when the cloud moved, the, uh, you know, the Levites who had charge of the tabernacle, they would take the tabernacle down, and then they would follow that cloud where the cloud went. And when the cloud stopped, and then they would erect the tabernacle back again. And that's where, of course, they would worship God, and they would stay there. And the Bible says they would rest in their tents. As long as the cloud remained stationary, they rested in their tents. They did not try to move, they did not try to go, unless the cloud moved first and guided them, and God promised he would go before them and find a resting place for them. Now they reached a place called Kadesh Barnea. And that's right on the border of Canaan's land. 
And they have an opportunity to go into Canaan's land to inherit that land as God had promised them. But they came to Moses with a request. And the request was to send 12 spies into the land of Egypt, excuse the land of Canaan, to spy out the land. And from a human perspective, that seemed to be very reasonable. It seemed to be a, you know, just a good move, military-wise, you might say, to spy out the land, try to gain all the knowledge you can of the land. But the Lord already told them everything about the land they need to know. He already named the nations that was in that land. He told them this land is fruitful. This land flows with milk and honey. There was nothing else about the land they needed to know. But they thought they did. And so Moses gave in and appointed one man out of every tribe to go into the land of Canaan and to search it out. Now, as they're searching out the land, they're not being led by this cloud. They're not being led by the Lord. They're, they're being led by their, own, by their own intellect. And they're in there. They covered about 500 miles on that search. And then they came back. Here's where we're introduced to a man by the name of Caleb for the first time. Before it's all said and done, he'll be mentioned many times in the Word of God. Joshua is one of these 12. We've already been introduced to him. If you remember the first conflict, first battle Israel had in Exodus chapter 17, he was the commander, he was the general of the army down in the valley. This is where Moses is on the mountain with Aaron and Hur. And as long as his hands was up, they, you know, everything swung in favor of Joshua and them. His hands came down. It swung in favor of the Amalekites. So Aaron and Hur got on each side of him. They lifted up his hands. We see the support, the unity, the uh, harmony here, of everybody involved in this. And God blessed Joshua and them to win that battle. Next, we find Joshua being a servant of Moses. And finally, Joshua will be the successor of Moses to bring Israel into the land of Canaan. But now, he's one of the 12 spies. They come back, and they bring back the same report from the standpoint that the land's a fertile land, it's a rich land, it flows with milk and honey. God already told them that. There's nothing in this report. God hadn't already told them ahead of time. There's giants in the land. They named the nations. God already told them all about this. They didn't discover anything new in going into the land. But it shows they doubted the word of God. And then they brought back what God... Uh, tells us was an evil report because this report caused the hearts of the people to melt. Now, I believe Caleb, if you read this, you'll find after the report is given here that Caleb and Joshua must have sensed the restlessness of the people. And Caleb spoke up and Caleb says, we be well able to take the land. Not just able, we be well able to take the land as God has promised us. Caleb is walking by faith. Now, the ten spies were going to say, we're not able. And he says, we are in the sight of the enemy as grasshoppers. You know what Caleb said? He says, God will enable us to take the land, and he'll make the inhabitants of that land as grasshoppers for us. Now, that's the difference, brother, between walking by faith and walking by sight. Ten of these spies are walking by sight. Two spies are walking by faith. Joshua and Caleb are walking by faith. But the people listened to the ten spies. And the Lord was upset. The Lord was angry with them. The Lord was not pleased. And the Lord said, you're going to wander in this wilderness one year for every day you spy that land. You spy that land for 40 days, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And you know what? Joshua and Caleb had to wander around with them, even though they felt like they could go in and take the land, but... They had to spend that time there. But he says, everybody from 20 years old and older will perish in the land. But he says, your children will be blessed to go into the land. And that's in, that's in response to what they had said. They said, you brought us and our children to perish here in the wilderness. The Lord says, your children won't perish, but you will. And over a span of 40 years, everybody over the age of 20 perished in that wilderness. They wandered away. Now, you read in the Psalms where David prays oftentimes for the Lord to keep him from wandering. A lot of God's people are wandering today. Not wondering, they're wandering. <laughs> they're moving away, uh, you know, from the service of God. They're drifting away. Have you ever been to the, to the ocean, to the beach, and you go out in the water, you know, they're playing the waves one thing or another, and after you're out there a little while, you look up, and nothing looks familiar. 
You know, you don't see the, the cottage you're staying in or the motel you're staying in or the condo, whatever it might be. Nothing looks familiar. And you know why? Because the time you went in, the time you look back, you begin to drift down the coastline. Didn't even realize it. Didn't even realize it. You had to try to work your way back out and then try to find where you started at. And that's what the world will do to you. You just drift a little at a time, a little at a time, a little at a time. Wander a little at a time, a little at a time. First thing you know, you don't even know where you're at. The children of Israel, they wandered in that wilderness for 40 long years. Now God had given them a cloud to direct them and it did direct them and guide them during this journey here. And it was a cloud in the daytime and that cloud sheltered them from the fierce heat of the desert. And that fire at night, I believe, gave them heat, but it gave them light to be able to travel. Sometimes they traveled in the daytime, sometimes they traveled in the nighttime. God says in Psalms 32, I will guide thee with mine eye. Now, I don't need a pillar of a cloud today or a pillar of fire tonight. I just need what God's given me, and God's given me his word, right? God's given me his word. That's how he's going to guide me at this time. But I'm thankful that I can pray to God who knows the future as well as the present, as well as the past. I'm thankful I can pray to God over the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation when those four beasts fall down and give him glory. They say, glory, uh, uh, rather, uh, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. That covers the past, the present, and the future. God will guide you with his eye. Now, when you start in chapter 10, we find where the Lord told Moses to make two trumpets of silver. Now, when you read about trumpets in the Old Testament, when Joshua and them marched around the city of Jericho, trumpets were employed then, but they were not trumpets of silver. They were trumpets made out of ram's horns. And when Gideon is 300 men, they surrounded the camp. Every man had a pitcher in his hand with a light in a pitcher and a, and a trumpet in the other hand. That was not a silver trumpet. It was a trumpet made out of ram's horns. Once again, that was sufficient for the situation for that particular battle. For that particular fear, it was sufficient, but these are going to be special trumpets. Not going to be a multitude of trumpets. It's going to be two trumpets. They're going to be made out of silver. Of a whole piece thou shalt make them. Both trumpets are made of silver out of a solid piece. And they're going to be blown by the sons of the priest. Aaron had two sons. Those two sons will blow these two trumpets. Now, when they blew, um, they would blow the trumpets in a certain way. That means that the people of Israel should assemble themselves together. If they blow it another way, it means just the leaders of the Israelites were to gather together. And then they could blow it another way, and it would get them an alarm, especially those going out to do war. Uh, in other words, the Lord is communicating with them through trumpets. The Lord is going to direct them and guide them with the blowing of these trumpets. But these trumpets are silver trumpets. There's two of them made out of silver. Silver is a pure metal. Over in the book of Psalms, Psalms 12, 6 and 7, the psalmist David says, For the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver purified in the furnace of the earth, or as silver in the furnace of the earth purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them forever. Now what that text is simply saying here is just like silver that has been purified as it gone through the furnace seven times, got rid of all the dross, the word of God is like that silver then. There's no dross on the word of God. There's no error in the word of God. No error whatsoever. Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 15, to study and show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God's Word is a miraculous book. It is an amazing book. It's the most interesting book I've ever held in my hands, to say the least. It's the only book I've ever read. I read it over and over and over again. And the more I read it, and the more I learn, the more I understand, it helps me understand and realize and know how little I know. How much more there is to know. But I also recognize the importance. This is not like a novel you pick up and read. This isn't like a textbook. This is a very special book that God wrote in a very special way, in a very special manner. And there's a very special way to read this book, approach this book, and study this book with the desire to know the truth that's contained in this book. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Ministers are to, you know, they, they realize their call of God to preach the truth of the word of God, and they should seek the approval of God. 
Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. There is work involved in studying the Word of God. Rightly dividing the Word of truth. Not dividing truth from error, but rightly dividing the Word of truth. The Word is truth, but it has to be rightly divided. A lot of work in doing that. I know I've mentioned this to you before, but kind of think about it when I think about this. Back when Brother Mark was about five years old, six years old, somewhere like that, I took him with me on a preaching trip to Georgia, and we went home with somebody for lunch, and on the side, the man of the house asked him what I did. He says, nothing. <laughs> He'd see me in the study, opening the Bible, reading the Bible. To him, that was nothing. He'd see me preaching the gospel in the pulpit, the house of God. That was nothing. He didn't see where there was too much to all of that. <laughs> we had a good talk on the way home. <laughs> no stopping at Dairy Queen for you, brother. <laughs> I used to bribe them. I said, if you don't go with me on this trip, we'll stop and get a blizzard. <laughs> Back in that day, the Dairy Queen was famous for their blizzards. So I'd bribe them to go with me on the trip. I said, oh, we'll stop and get a blizzard. Oh, they like that. Just, of course, sometimes it's hard to find one, but anyway, if we did, I kept my word about that. Anyway, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, when I think of these two trumpets of silver here, now silver is, uh, is durable, silver is long lasting, uh, silver is valuable, silver is scarce. See, the Lord had to make it out of, out of silver, something that would last, something that was valuable. And the Word of God is valuable, and the Word of God will continue until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's promised to preserve His inspired Word. We find the inspiration of God taught very clearly in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, which means God breathed. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Every Scripture in the Word of God is profitable if you understand it and apply it. It's profitable doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and rights that the man of God might be perfect through the furnished and all good works. You don't need anything in addition to God's Word. God's Word is perfect as it is. You don't have to add to it. You don't have to take away from it. You don't have to try to alter it in any way. God gave it to us in a perfect way, and God's promised to preserve it. And then I like the way the Apostle Peter speaks about it. In 2 uh, excuse me, in, uh, uh, yeah, 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, We have a more sure word of prophecy that you do well to take your heed as into a light in a dark place. He says, for the prophecy of the Scripture, no private interpretation. That means it's not based upon the will of man, not based upon the, uh, one man's thoughts, another man's thoughts, one thing or another. It's a no private interpretation. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That expression, moved by the Holy Ghost, is a picture of a ship on the sea being moved, you know, with sails, being moved by the wind across the water. That's how God's Word came into existence, in a very miraculous, powerful, providential way. And God promised to preserve it. People sometimes have difficulty thinking about how God's Word could be preserved over the centuries. Well, if God could create the heaven and the earth, and He did, why would he have trouble preserving his word? If God can raise the dead, and he has and promised he will, why would God have trouble preserving his word? Uh, no problem whatsoever. No problem. God moves in his own way, in his, own, in his providence, and he has watched over his word and kept it just like it was, I believe, originally when he had to give him a divine inspiration. We find where the writer here says, You tell Moses to make two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece thou shalt make them. These are silver trumpets. These are a picture of purity. No corruption. A picture, again, of purity. It's like the Word of God is. When I think about the Word of God and the twos that's represented in it, you know, the Bible is made up of two, two parts, Old Testament and New Testament. When I'm talking to somebody about why we don't have musical instruments in the house of God, they always want to take me to the book of Psalms. I always tell them the wrong side of the Bible. Over here in the right-hand side of the Bible is the New Testament, which is, gives us the pattern for New Testament worship. The New Testament is the blueprint for New Testament worship. I was talking to my good friend Rico again the other day, and I said, Rico, let me just tell you this. I said, let's say I want to build me a house. 
and you're the contractor. And I bring, and you say, well, have you got a blueprint? And I say, yeah, I got a blueprint. And I bring you the blueprint. I bring you the plans. And we lay it all out. And we talk about it. We see the blueprint. We see the plans. And I say, now, I'm going to be gone about 90 days. How long will it take you to build it? He says, I'm building it in 90 days. I said, well, that's good. I'll be back in about 90 days. And I'll, I'll be back and we'll, we'll see it. Okay, so I'm back in 90 days. And I go take a look at the house. The blueprint called this house to be 3,200 square feet. I look at it and I'll see it's 3,800 square feet. This blueprint called for eight rooms. I find there's 10 rooms. The blueprint called for a window over here, but there's no window there. The blueprint called for the kitchen to be a certain size. It's a different size. Oh, it's got a kitchen, it's got windows, it's got walls, it's got a roof, but it's not according to the blueprint. Not according to the pattern. I said, I. Why is it carpet on this floor instead of hardwood? Well, I just thought it'd be quieter. I, I thought carpet would be better. So I put carpet in the place of the hardwood. And I put a window over here because I thought it had a great view and you'd like a window over here. And I thought, well, you know, 3,200 feet, that's a pretty good sized house, but I just feared you and your family, you need a bigger house, so I made it 3,800 feet. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Do you understand what I'm saying here? He didn't have the right to change that blueprint. He didn't have the right to make the house bigger, put a window over here and carpet instead of that because I told him to build it according to the blueprint. I told him to build it according to the pattern. I laid out the plans. We talked about the plans. I wanted it built 3,200 square feet. I wanted a certain size, certain amount of rooms, et cetera, et cetera. I come back, he built me a house, but it's not according to the blueprint. The New Testament church has a blueprint. The New Testament church has a pattern that we find from Matthew to Revelation, 27 books that teach us what the church of the Lord Jesus Christ should look like. In Matthew chapter 16, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Lord is the head of the church. He's the foundation of the church. He's the architect of the church. He laid it out for us. He laid it out. I understand that David M. used musical instruments over here in the Old Testament day. That was the Old Testament day. The Bible teaches us two modes of worship. There's a worship of the ceremonial law in the Old Testament day under Moses, and there's a worship over here in the New Testament day according to apostolic standards and apostolic practice and doctrine. You're in the wrong side of the book. If you want to go to that side of the book, then I'm going to tell you well, you need to start bringing lambs to the house of God. You need to start making offerings and sacrifices with bringing lambs and rams and everything else to the house of God. You need to uh, be sure that you do this and do that because that's all according to the law of Moses over here. If you're going to go back and pick one thing, you better go back and get them all. But we're not to go over here and pick from the old. We're to go over here in the new. Now, the old and the new, they harmonize. But we're in a different dispensation of time, different dispensation of worship in the New Testament church than they were in the Old Testament church. So when the gospel preacher is preaching today, and by the way, the uh, trumpet uh, has always been used as being symbolic of a gospel preacher. In Isaiah 58, 1, Isaiah says, Cry loud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. When the gospel preacher is preaching, it's like blowing the trumpet. And so sometimes a gospel preacher might be blowing the trumpet from the Old Testament because Romans 15, 4 says, The things written aforetime was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort the scriptures might have hope. So I've been preaching the Old Testament quite a bit this morning, right? And, and I'm learning some things from the Old Testament. I'm learning what not to do as well as what to do. Because human nature was the same back then as it is over here. Man hadn't changed over the years. He still got the same human nature. He still acts and reacts to things today just like he did back in that day. I learned a lot of things in studying these lessons over here in the Old Testament, but when it comes to worship, I'm over here in the New Testament according to the New Testament pattern and blueprint that God has given unto us. I think sometimes people have a little difficulty about this from the standpoint, as I've tried to point out from time to time, when God gave Noah instructions to build an ark, he gave him the blueprint to build the ark. He told me exactly how many stories to have, three. How many windows to have, one. How many doors to have, one. 
He told them how long it was be, how broad it was be, how high it was going to be. He gave them the blueprint. And the Bible says Noah built the ark according to God's commandments. He did all that God commanded him to do. And therefore, when the flood came, the ark floated. God gave instructions to Moses to build the tabernacle. Gave him those instructions you find in Exodus 25 through 40. 16 chapters. We're going to cover the details of building that tabernacle and everything that went into that tabernacle. God gave Moses the blueprint and charged him, you build the tabernacle as I showed thee in the mount. Moses built it exactly like God showed him in the mount. You know what happened when the, blue, when the tabernacle was finally constructed and put up? You know what took place? The glory of God filled the tabernacle. You think the glory of God would have filled the tabernacle if the tabernacle had not been built according to the blueprint? It would not have. Then we have Solomon, and God is going to instruct Solomon to build the temple. And he gives him the blueprint. He took seven years to build the temple. And Solomon built the temple exactly according to the blueprint, exactly according to uh, the plans that God gave unto him. He didn't make one change, one alteration. He built it exactly like God showed him. You know what happened when he got the temple built? The glory of God filled the temple. You think the glory of God would have filled the temple if Solomon, in all his wisdom, would have thought, well, I know God said make it this size. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger than that or shorter than that or narrower than that. I won't add this, but I'll add that one thing or another. God would never have honored the temple and Solomon not built it according to the pattern. Built it according to the pattern. In Ephesians 3, 21, Paul says, And to him be glory in the church throughout all generations, world without end. That tells me two or three things. It tells me the Lord's church, as he set it up, would be here to the end of time. That shows me and tells me that the Lord's church will be here by God's providence somewhere. Somebody will be worshiping God in spirit and in truth according to God's word. And that, that's two things right there. As you go to John chapter 4, you'll find here where the Lord has met with uh, the woman of Samaria. And in that conversation, he tells the woman of Samaria, he says, the time is coming when they will not worship at Jerusalem nor in this mountain. He says, because they shall worship me in spirit and in truth, for God seeketh such to worship him. Two things here. Here's the two gospel trumpets being blown. One blown in the spirit, one blown in the truth. When God's ministers preach the gospel, it needs to be in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. It needs to be the truth according to God's Word. He says, for God seeketh such to worship Him. Notice this. He seeketh such to worship Him in spirit and also in truth. These are two gospel trumpets. These are two silver trumpets made out of a whole piece. Uh, these are pure gospel trumpets to put forth the purity of God's Word even in the Old Testament day. So when a gospel preacher preaches, sometimes he might blow out a one concerning events in the Old Testament. He may be blowing another one out of the New Testament, and most times he'll blow out of both of them while he's preaching one message. There are subjects that need to be rightly divided, such as the Son of Man, Son of God. When the Lord Jesus Christ came in this world, he came forth as God's beloved Son. He took upon himself human flesh and became the Son of Man. Christ referred to himself more times as a son of man than he ever did in the son of God. He left it up to people to recognize who he was as God's son. I come to Matthew chapter 16, and the Lord asked the apostle Peter and the disciples this question. He says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Notice, he didn't say son of God. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Most everybody recognized he was the son of man. They knew his mother Mary and his legal guardian, Joseph, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Peter says, well, some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elias. Um, others say you're one of the other prophets. They were all wrong. These were all good men, but they were not the son of man. They were all good men, well-known men. They were not the son of man. Then Jesus got more direct. He said, but whom do ye say that I am? And the apostle Peter spoke up and said, we believe, I believe, they are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now we got son of man, we got son of God. In the four gospels, 
Son of Man is mentioned 82 times. Son of God is mentioned 41 times, exactly twice as many. Jesus referred to himself as a Son of Man as a general rule. Now, he never denied he was a Son of God, and he taught that in a different way when he made reference to his Father time and time and time again. Remember John 6, 38 and 39? For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, and this is the Father's will, all he hath given me, I should lose nothing but raise it up again at the last day. Did you hear what he said there? This is the Father's will. All he hath given me, that's unconditional election, all he hath given me, I should lose nothing, preservation, raise it up again at the last day, resurrection, end of time. The Lord taught all that in, that, in that, those two little short verses right there. And I can give you many other verses about that where he always acknowledged his Father in heaven. And you know, there's two times they um, picked up stones to stone the Lord Jesus Christ with, and both times it was because he claimed equality with the Father. In John chapter 5, the Lord has healed a man in the synagogue, but he did it on the Sabbath day. And they didn't like that. And they picked up stones to stone him with. And the Lord questioned about this, and they told him, it's because ye have made yourself equal with God. In John chapter 10, when the Lord Jesus Christ set forth him being the good shepherd of the sheep, he said, I know my sheep, they hear my voice, they follow me, I give unto them eternal life, they shall never perish. And my Father which gave them me is greater than all of them, and, can, and, and no man can pluck them out of my hand, and my Father which gave them me, though no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand, for I am the Father of one, they picked up the stones and stoned it. And the Lord asked them a question. He said, for what good, I've done many good works among you. For what good work did I do pick up stones and stone me with? They said, for a good work we stone thee not. But thou being a man has made thyself God. Jesus never made himself God. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh the entire time. And when you're studying the full gospel of life of the Lord and Jesus Christ, if you don't understand him being the Son of Man and also the Son of God, you're going to be very confused at times. The Bible teaches us as a Son of Man, He could thirst. As a Son of Man, He could hunger. As a Son of Man, He could become weary. As a Son of Man, He could have pain. He could have sorrow. He could shed tears. He did all that as a Son of Man. As a Son of God, He had the power to steal the storms. He had the power to say, Peace be still, and the wind quit blowing. And the ways of subsiding had come completely calm. He had the power to do that. As a son of God, he could say, Lazarus, come forth. And out of that tomb and out of that grave, Lazarus was wheeled out of there by the voice of the son of God. He was just wheeled right out of the state of death he was in, and he was alive once more. He was a son of man. He was also the son of God. That's rightly dividing the word of truth. Sometimes you blow with one trumpet about him being the son of man. Sometimes you blow with another trumpet about him being the son of God. Both trumpets are trumpets of silver. They are pure, pure silver. Both doctrines, both teachings are true. But it's important that you understand the person of Christ and also the work of Christ. The two go hand in hand together. That's why Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, I'm determined of nothing among you saving Jesus Christ as his person and him crucified, that's his work. We believe that Christ lived in this world, made an offering sacrifice that was perfect in the sight of the Heavenly Father. And as a result of that, he obtained eternal redemption for us. His offering was accepted. That was the proof of that was when he was resurrected by the Father from the tomb. When I began to look into the four Gospels, those who recognized him for who he was as the Son of God, it's a pretty interesting list. In Matthew chapter 27, you're going to find where the high priest come to him, and here's their question. If thou be the Son of God, tell us plainly. And those that were walking around the cross, they looked up at him, and they began to mock him, and said, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Pilate asked him, art thou the Son of God? Plainly tell us. What did Peter say in Matthew chapter 16? I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here's what Nathaniel said when the Lord had an encounter with him. Remember that in John chapter 1? He told Nathaniel, when thou was under the fig tree, I knew thee and saw thee. Nathaniel thought, he, 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 he responded like this, thou art, the, thou art the king of Israel and the son of God. When the disciples were on that storm, in that storm in Matthew chapter 8, and the Lord stilled us, you know what they said as a result of that? Truly, thou art the son of God. 
when he came to the grave of Lazarus. And he's talking with Martha. He tells her, I'm the resurrection and the life. She responded by saying, I know that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We got Peter, we got Nathaniel, we got Martha. We got the disciples. And then we come over here to the cross. When Jesus Christ is hanging on that cross, it's real interesting to study the witnesses around that cross. It won't take time to do that this morning, but I do want to say something about one witness. And that was a centurion who was a Roman soldier, a Gentile. You know what he said? When Christ was crucified, and there was a three hours of darkness from 12 to 3, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. The devils knew he was the Son of God. And yet the chief priests and, and scribes and the leaders and the elders of the Jewish people, they were always going around, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. If you be the Christ, come down from the cross. They were not convinced he was the Son of God, but the common people were. I love the expression found in Mark, and the common people heard him gladly. The common people heard him gladly. Not the elite, not the scribes, not the priests, not the chief elders. No, they didn't hear him gladly. They didn't hear him gladly at all, but the common people did. Just let me be identified with the common people. That's all I want. I just want to be identified with the common people. I want to be identified with God-fearing people. I want to be identified with people who love the Lord. I want to be identified with people who desire to hear the true word of God about his sovereign grace. I want to be identified with a people that believe salvation is of the Lord from beginning to end and from first to last. I want to be identified with a people that understand that salvation, my friends, is sure and complete in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can be added to it and they can be taken away from it. That soothes my heart, it soothes my soul, it brings rest to my heart and soul, and it feeds my heart and soul. Just let me be associated with the common people. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and says, he says, you know, brother, how not many mighty men, not many wise men, not many noble men are called... He didn't say not any, he just said not many. <laughs> just let me be associated with the common people. I hope you don't take offense at that. I, I don't, I want to be one of the common people. I want to be one of the little people. <laughs> I just want to be one of those that David says, you know, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For one day in their courts is better than a thousand. Just let me be among the common people. One day. Is better than a thousand out here in the world. Just to be a doorkeeper in God's house. But you know, I got the thing about a doorkeeper. He gets to see everybody that comes in. He gets to smile at everybody that comes in. He gets to shake hands at everybody that comes in. You know, that's, that's Brother Mike. <laughs> but we all can be like that, can we not? We all can be doorkeepers in the house of God. What a blessing it is. I tell you, I wasn't feeling the highest when I got here this morning. I wasn't. I feel a lot higher right now than I did when I got here, though. I'll tell you that. I wasn't feeling the highest when I got here this morning. But as soon as I got out of the door and started walking into this wonderful place, and I began to see the smiles. I, I could see Brother Kenny walking in without a limp. <laughs> He's getting along so fine, isn't he? And to see the smiles of different ones and the handshake and, and just the eagerness I could just see in the people getting ready to worship God and get here and sing them hymns of Zion and praise God and give him the adoration that he deserved. I just started feeling better. The thoughts of this world began to diminish and began to fade away. And I just thought, what a glorious place this is to be where I can come and mingle with God's people, with the common people, where I can come and meet the Lord in his house. He's promised where two or three are gathered together in my name. There, I'd be in the midst. I'm telling you, I'm a blessed person this morning to be in the company of such blessed people, to be in the blessed house of God where God has promised to meet with us when we come to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I got to about half of what I wanted to say this morning. <laughs> but Lord willing, there will be another day. <laughs> Thank you so much for your prayers, your encouragement, and your support. As always, I thank God, as I say from time to time, for your attendance. But I thank you for your attention.